Hey comp covers, so today we are beginning our last topic in our society, our society uh, frame. So political culture is really important. Um, it actually encompasses 3.2, 3.3, 3.4 of the AP Comparative Government Curriculum. So um, political culture kind of determines a lot about um, how a society behaves. Right, the decisions that that society makes in terms of governance. So political culture, by definition, is the collective attitudes, values, beliefs of the citizenry, and the norms of behavior in the political system. So how do they, how do people in that society behave? Right, what are their values? What are their attitudes? What are their beliefs? It sets expectations about the exercise of power to establish a balance between social order and individual liberty, which is a constant struggle for many countries to balance that order, right? Maintaining order, and but also infringing upon individual liberty. So political culture is influenced by factors of geography. Um, we'll be seeing some examples of that in our case studies today. Religious traditions. Uh, political culture is influenced by its history. Um, political culture is influenced by forming a population's values, beliefs about the role of government. So what is the role of government? How do people see that? The rights of the individual. Do they have rights? Do they not have rights? What is a priority? Social order or individual liberty? Um, and you should, uh, I should have, um, Put in red individual liberty and social order so make sure that those are words you can work you can use right social order is exactly that maintaining order in society not letting protests go on too long just maintaining social order um and political culture is transmitted through the process of political socialization so the difference between political culture and political socialization one is the beliefs values and attitudes of a citizenry the other is how do the citizens get those or acquire those beliefs, values, and um, attitudes. Families, um, schools, peers, religious institutions, the media, social environments, um, civic organizations, civil society play a crucial role in socialization um, in that process. And it does help foster uh, political attitudes and values. So there are many agents of socialization. So just these things that I just mentioned, family, school, peers, media, religious organizations, um, even the government itself through propaganda um, are, so, are agents of socialization. All right, um, so uh, political ideologies. So what are some of the beliefs, right, and attitudes? So political ide ideology is a set of values and beliefs about the goal of government the goal of public policy um, and just the goal uh, that you expect from your government. So one political ideology is individualism. Sometimes we refer to it as liberalization. So it's the belief in individual civil liberties and freedoms over government restrictions. So individual liberty, that is individualism. In class, I always refer to it as liberalization. So you can use those terms interchangeably neoliberalism and this is the belief in limited government intervention in the economy um and uh it does tend to support privatization as opposed to nationalization privatization is when private companies or individuals own the industries um nationalization is when the government owns the industries uh, neoliberal policies are all about free trade right no restrictions on trade um, this is reducing government tariffs, uh, reducing government intervention in, in general. That's called deregulation. And the elimination of state subsidies. State subsidies are government assistance to companies. So like farming is often subsidized, like corn farming uh, is often subsidized. Those corn prices are, are helped by the U.S. government. They, uh, they pay corn farmers right, more than perhaps the market value for them. Communism. Communism is the belief in the abolition of private property with near total governmental control. The ideal is equality, and that way um, no one 
owns private property, rather um, everyone owns everything through the government. And that is the, the manifestation of communism um, in modern society. Marxism, remember, is where people own everything. Um, and then communism is where people own through the government. So governments tend to be large. Socialism. Socialism is the belief in the reduction of income disparities, not the emulation. The goal here is not equality for socialism. That's communism. The goal here is to reduce income disparity. Um, and you do this through nationalizing major private industries. So government controlled industries, not all industries, just many industries, right? In order to reduce income disparity, fascism. Fascism is extreme nationalism that favors authoritarian rule and the rights of the ethnic majority over the ethnic minority. Um, populism, this is political philosophy that supports the interests and rights of the common people over the elite. So we're going to start to see a lot of populism, um, for example, in Mexico. So it favors the common people over the elites. You remember in U.S., uh, history, the populist movement did the same thing, the common farmer versus the eastern banker. All right, and then political values and beliefs. So contrasting political ideologies, including the rule by law as opposed to rule of law, affect how the state treats its citizens and deals with specific problems such as political corruption. So political values and beliefs, these are a part of political culture, right? These are the distinct values. So maybe a, a country values rule by law like China, or there are some countries that prioritize rule of law like the UK. Political beliefs associated with authoritarian regimes tend to rely on rule by law, as we've just mentioned. Uh, political beliefs associated with democratic regimes tend to rely on rule of law. All right. So um, beliefs about social and economic equality can be held by citizens in both democratic and authoritarian regimes, but can be contrasted by the amount of enforcement responsibility transferred to the government and the amount of choice afforded to citizens to protect their health and material well-being. So some societies believe that the government should provide social protections. Right. And if you if the government provides total social profession, uh, a lot of social protections, protecting the citizen, meaning whether it's through a nationalized health care or through a retirement plan for the citizens, when it's a lot of government social protections, then it's often referred to as a welfare state. In the United States, um, our political value is limited government social protections. Right. Whereas the UK tends to have a little bit more than the United States ideas of governmental social protections. Um, but areas like China are essentially a welfare state. They call it the iron rice bowl. Post materialism refers to social valuing of self-expression and quality of life that leads to applying pressure on governments to address environmental issues and social and economic equality. So um, this is post-materialism is almost like post-industrialism. So after a country goes through its industrial revolution and realizes they're wrecking the environment, we're going to start to see um, societies, um, citizens, wanting to increase the quality of life um, and apply pressure on governments to address environmental issues. Right. So post-materialism materialism referring to the materials produced by industry. All right, so let's go to our case studies. So um, in the UK, some of the political um, values are individualism or liberalization. That's their political ideology, rather. I misspoke. The political ideology is individualism or liberalism. But they do have a history of social democracy. And um, one of their political values is noblesse oblige. This is the duty of the upper class to take responsibility for the welfare of the lower class. And so this dates back to feudalistic times when, when um, the uh, lords would protect the serfs uh, and the serfs would, would uh, in, in turn farm the land. 
Um, Noblesse Oblige can be a good thing because it did go on to inspire the National Health Service, which is their universal single-payer health care plan, which uh, originated after World War II. And um, Noblesse Oblige, the idea was, no, um, after the havoc of World War II, we need to provide health care to all. And so there is some um, tendencies towards a welfare state in the UK, but there's also pushback on that tendency of a welfare state. For example, in the 1980s, Margaret Thatcher, her government brought the idea that the welfare state um, is potentially a bad thing. And so she began cutting all of these government services, these social services that um, was brought on during the collective consensus period after World War II. Cutbacks in education, cutbacks in health care, cutbacks in transportation, that kind of thing. All right, so noblesse oblige the idea. Let's now move to another um, political ideology, or rather a political belief, and that is uh, gradualism. So that's the thing about the UK. Keep calm, carry on, right? So this traditionalism and gradualism is a big part of their political culture. So their monarchy evolved over time, starting, of course, with William the Conqueror, who um, is going to bring all of the various tribes together. And those tribal leaders essentially became the House of Lords. And with the Magna Carta in 1215, we have the formation of the House of Lords in 1236. Uh, soon the House of Commons. So instead of just the Lords, right, let's, let's uh, give some voice to the common people. So we started to see the development of a House of Commons in 1341. Um, and then soon we have the ascendancy of Parliament over the monarch um, with the rise of democracy. Um, part of that tr gradualism includes the Civil War. Um, this was essentially a civil war between um, those who supported a strong parliament and those who supported a strong monarchy. The restoration. So we're like, okay, let's restore the monarchy. Um, but then we have the glorious revolution. Let's bring, let's bring um, Protestantism back to the monarchy. Remember, they, um, they uh, under Henry VIII, instituted the Anglican Church, which is a uniquely Protestant church um, known as the Church of England or the Anglican Church. Um, and uh, with the Glorious Revolution, we also have the signing by William and Mary of Orange, the English Bill of Rights. And this basically gave more power to Parliament over the monarchy. Um, so Parliament is made up of two bodies, but we're going to see the ascendancy in the House of Commons and the Prime Minister as a result of the Industrial Revolution. Remember these merchants and these other commoners started to gain wealth um, and therefore power. And we see the decline in the House of Lords. By 1999, we are seeing that it is no longer an inherited situation, but an appointed situation, and their power is greatly reduced. So another part of their political beliefs um, are the acceptance of a democracy. They do believe in individualism and democratic ideals. Again, Anglicanism. And then political socialization. This is the agents of um, political culture. And that includes education. Um, there's also a class distinction, middle class versus working class. Each class has their own values and, and promotes their own values. Um, and part of that is education. Uh, uh, they also have, for higher ed, Oxbridge, either Ox, uh, uh, you know, Oxford or Cambridge. Um, Anglicanism and the BBC. Don't forget the BBC is a is their media that is going to promote a certain um, you know they they're going to put the BBC is this media outlet is going to put things that are interested uh, to the Brits. All right, um, let's go to Russia. So Russia, um, one of its big things it's that it's authoritarian. It's also referred to as statism, where we have a strong state authoritarianism. Um, and Russia's history is a history of monarchies um, and because these monarchies basically protect the Russian citizens from numerous foreign invasions and a relative lack of geographic protection. 
they um, were often invaded uh, because of their geography. And it's contributed to a political culture that values a strong state, a monarchy that can defend and protect um, its citizens. As a result, this has made Russia a poor candidate for democracy um, because they have always had essentially an authoritarian um, system. So uh, remember the last of the monarchs was Nicholas II of Romanov, and he is overthrown um, because he was essentially weak. He allowed um, the Russo-Japanese War in the 1930s in which Japan was totally beating, this island nation was totally beating Russia. And of course, the World War II, in which Russian soldiers, I'm sorry, World War I, in which Russian soldiers were fighting without shoes and weapons, right? So that's weak, that was a weak government. So that government will be overthrown and we see the rise of, of Marxism through Vladimir Lenin. So Marxism, Leninism isn't exactly Marxism. Leninism um, is something that, uh, that was unique to Russia because Marxism touts that you need to be an industrialized country in order to see um, class struggle. But Lenin's is like, well, Russia's not industrialized, but we're still experiencing class struggle. So he's gonna bring about more of the idea of democratic centralism, still central, right? Meaning that power is still concentrated in government. So a little bit of an authoritarian, but you know, power to the people, democratic, let the people have a voice. Um, Leninism also en encompasses the idea of a vanguard party, and that is a party that claims to operate in the true interest of the people, even if those interests are not the expressed interests of the people. So we're going to do what's good for you, maybe not what you want, but what we think is good for you. And so the Communist Party is under Lenin and, uh, you know, under subsequent Russian uh, authoritarians are going to embrace the concept of the political value of a vanguard party. All right, so Leninism, Marxism was as a result of the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. We already said all this. Um, and then after Lenin, Lenin dies and is unable to fulfill his democratic centralism ideal. And instead, Stalin is going to usurp power and tout communism. Now, does he intend to bring about communism? No, he becomes a totalitarian dictator. Um, and the Communist Party was a way to control the Russian citizens. Now the Communist Party will exist, right, from 19, I guess, uh, you could say 1917 under Stalin, more like 1925, all the way through 1991. And we see uh, the Soviet Union collapsing as a result of some uh, economic problems. Yeltsin will be the first democratic president for the state of Russia. And he tries democracy, um, and they do write a constitution um, about democracy. However, under Putin, um, who succeeded Yeltsin, Putin has essentially returned it to authoritarianism. So it's, it is a hybrid system. It is technically a, a democratic state, but it is authoritarian. Other political values is the East versus West, often referred to as Slav, as in Slavic, Slavophile versus Westernizer. So there were some Western lovers within Russian history, like Peter the Great, Catherine the Great, um, Boris Yeltsin, versus those who were more uh, Slavophiles. This is the Russian Orthodox religion, which, in, which separated itself from Protestant and Catholicism, the Roman Catholicism of the West. They went more towards the Byzantine Constantinople type of religion, which is Russian Orthodoxy. So that's more Eastern. Um, and Putin, Putin was also um, very uh, Slavophile, right? Um, embracing the idea that we should move away from the West. The West is our enemy. Another political value is um, the Russian egalitarianism, the idea of equality of condition versus equality of opportunity. So if you know we're all equal, right? It's not very conducive to capitalism, and it, uh, Russia has struggled with capitalism. Not only did it lead to uh, attempts by Gorbachev to bring about um, perestroika, democratic reforms or capitalistic reforms, 
it was it, it fails and so um and currently russia under um, putin is experiencing economic problems all right corruption is also a big part of any authoritarian dictate any authoritarian ideal so uh there's corruption that's pervasive in, in bureaucracy and um there's there russians by their very nature are skeptical about those in power although they accept those in power socialization includes the russian orthodox church the communist party in the history in its history currently united russia right um the dominant party uh the nashi which are that youth communist youth uh program that is kind of pro-putin uh their education system and then their media remember their media is state-owned channel one all right china so china is also an authoritarian statism but it has some democratic characteristics kind of like what we see with russia um their history is one in much like much like um russia in a sense that they wanted a leader to protect them under dynastic rule this is kind of the chinese version of monarchies under dynastic rule um these various dynasties uh embraced old cultural norms like scholarship and hierarchy and order um a lot of that is based in confucianism right um the philosopher confucius uh he is all about the old culture scholarship hierarchy order and a ruler has the right to rule mandate of heaven as long as there is a reciprocal relationship if the ruler is doing a good job protecting the citizens um then the citizens will obey him but if the ruler is no longer protecting the citizens then it's time to change dynasties and so the last of the chinese dynasties was with the qin dynasty so china attempted um to become more democratic we see the revolution of 1911 um and this is china's brief stint into um into democracy under sun yat-sen but that's going to fall apart in the chinese civil war between the nationalists and the communists and so this is going to happen in the 1930s and 40s and finally um the communists under mao zedong is going to win in 1949 that chinese civil war and they integrated the ethics of confucianism with the communist values of egalitarianism meaning equality all right and uh, mao and this is called maoism right focused in on the strength of the peasant and placed value on idealism let's ideally become communistic as opposed to russia was just using communism it wasn't actually communistic uh whereas china wanted to, to truly be communistic and part of that plan was something called collectivism that what's best for the community collectively is a priority over individual liberty and so um the chinese communist party is also valuing a vanguard party doing what is in the best interest of the people maybe not what the people want so this new culture versus the old confucian culture so this new maoist culture right another value under maoism is a struggle right you must struggle you're going to struggle and activism so we're going to see that um there was a lot of both under mao including um the cultural revolution mass line this is another value under maoism where leaders must listen to and stay connected to the peasants because peasants uh he believed in the strength of the peasants and it's a source of legitimacy and again uh, you know that mandate of heaven thing um, that reciprocity that reciprocal relationship the peasants will honor the government if the government honors the peasant egalitarianism we've already said that another value under maoism self-reliance um there was a skepticism about elites this because this is supposed to be about the common man so that populist ideology um was a big part of maoism uh the iron rice bowl i talked about the welfare state this is another maoist belief that um the government should provide guarantees of lifetime employment income and basic cradle to grave benefits but then mao dies and so um the chinese government was experiencing 
difficulties and so it hadn't industrialized so Deng Xiaoping is gonna come um, and uh, he's gonna change things and he's gonna de uh China meaning instead of idealism let's do pragmatism more practical stuff instead of all this nationalism let's go to privatizations and so Deng is going to introduce capitalism um, into Chinese culture to keep it uh, from going bankrupt like what happened to the Russians. So um, his famous quote is, black cat, white cat, who cares as long as it catches the mice, right? More practical. He introduced the four modernization plan, which brought in more industry, more, collect more farming, individual ownership of farming, technology, and defense. And political socialization includes uh, Confucianism, the Chinese Communist Party, uh, the Long March, the Cultural Revolution that we referred to before. And, of course, during the Cultural Revolution, they produced the Little Red Book of all the Maoisms. Um, family and then media is controlled by the government. Um, remember, their main channel is Gi Inhui. Gi Inhui. All right, let's go to Mexico. So Mexico, which I failed to put all the red, the red stuff in this one. Oh, well. So um, for Mexico we're gonna see that they are transitioning. So they embrace democracy, but they do have a history of authoritarianism, uh, starting with Spanish colonization. So sp the Spanish under Hernan Cortez conquer the Aztecs, uh, and we're gonna see that the Spanish create social hierarchy um, that includes uh, the indigenous at the bottom, then the mestizo, then the criollos, which are Spanish, uh, Spaniards born in the New World. Um, the Spanish also bring with them, not in addition to social hierarchy, Catholicism. And one of the results is uh, of Spanish colonization is economic marginalization of the Mexican people because all the money was being made by the Spaniards, right, the Criollos, um, in their haciendas, which were basically plantations. And um, the Mexican people no longer owned the land, they are now working the land instead of owning the land. Um, and as a result of this long history of Spanish colonization, we do see a lack of a democratic tradition. As a matter of fact, the Spanish ruled New Spain with a viceroy or a vice king. All right, um, but then they achieved independence in 1821. And uh, you would think, okay, this is their time to shine, but they struggled. They struggled with democratization because democracies are fragile. And one of the biggest obstacles is foreign intervention. Um, during their post-war era, including intervention by the United States, um, intervention by the French, Napoleon does invade uh, uh, Mexico, um, of course, American intervention in the Mexican-American War, um, and of course, we took the Mexican session, so again, fragility associated with post-independence. But also part of the conflict that was making it difficult to establish a, a true democracy was this populist idea of liberals versus conservatives or peasants versus elites. So this was an ongoing struggle uh, throughout Mexican uh, history as they are going through their democratic phase. And of course, you know, um, they had strongmen. They had authoritarians. Uh, the Porfiriato was an example of this, and this is Porfiriato Diaz, and so Diaz was friendly to the U.S., but he was an authoritarian dictator, um, and, uh, you know, we, Mexico was for Americans, not Mexico for Mexicans, so that's going to end in revolution, so the, uh, the Porfiriato is going to end with the revolution of 1910 to 1920, and various caudillos, or sh these strong men that Mexico is called caudillos, they were fighting during this revolution for control of Mexico. And finally, we're gonna see an end in 1920 uh, with the Constitution of 1917, which is uh, there's the same constitution they're operating under now. Um, and um, Callez, Callez is going to bring about an end to all the strong men fighting with the institutionalization of the PRI or PRI. And this political party basically passed the baton from uh, strongman to strongman uh, in what is known as the Sixencio. There was continuing ongoing problems with the uh, Catholic Church, Christ the Cristeros Rebellion. This is a continued uh, fight, the liberals versus the conservatives, because the conservatives tended to side with the Catholic Church versus the liberal farmers and peasants. So this was an ongoing struggle. 
Um, another part of the PRI or PRI under the 75 year of this party's dominance, uh, again, having a series of strong men or called DOs, was the patron client system. And this is political corruption, really, um, as, uh, you know, in order to, uh, to participate in government, you had to play the game. So you got rewarded um, if you were loyal to the PRI party. Um, I will, so populism, again, is a major part of um, Mexican political culture. Again, the elite versus the, uh, the peasants. Um, and uh, revolutions, revolutions as we can see. Um, heading into the more future economic dependence, whether it was economic dependency on Spain or under NAFTA, under you know, economic dependence on the United States. Um, they do uh, have, unlike the next country, uh, a strong sense of national identity. So very proud to be Mexican, a lot of, Mex a lot of uh, celebration of being um, Mexican. There is a unification as Spanish speakers. Um, and political socialization includes the Catholic Church, PRI. Uh, schools use government-approved textbooks, uh, patron-client networks. Uh, media is openly critical of the government, but increasingly less so in print form. All right, next uh, is Nigeria. So Nigeria does not have a lot of national unification. As a matter of fact, that's their biggest struggle. They're struggling with nationalism. The national question due to their intense diversity, um, various different ethnic groups were kind of thrown together into the borders that we know as Nigeria, largely because of English colonization. So ethnic diversities are a big part of their political culture. In the Northwest, there's the Husay Falani. In the Northeast, they're Kanuri Muslims. Both Husay Falani and the Kanuri are Muslim. So in the North, it's largely Muslim. Then you have the Middle Belt. The Middle Belt is kind of a mix between Muslims and Christians. And we all know the herders versus the, um, the farmers controversy and conflict that's going on in Nigeria currently. All right, then we, as we move southward, we go into more Christian and animist um, uh, religions like the Yoruba and the Igbo. All right, so a little bit about their political culture. Um, in the north, as we said, is largely Muslim. So they, uh, Islam came to Nigeria in two ways, cultural diffusion, which means contact with and spread of customs and beliefs of other people, in this case, Muslim traders using the Silk Roads um, as they are moving further into the African continent. And um, they're coming into contact with the indigenous peoples and they are bringing with them their customs and beliefs of Islam. Um, another way that um, Islam is introduced to the North um, is through jihad. Jihad is Islamic holy war. Um, and uh, as a result, the North did institute a, an Islamic, uh, you know, was very Islamic, and it had what is known as the uh, Sakota Caliphate. Um, the Sakota Caliphate unified this Muslim state in the North, um, as, as well as the Husay Fulani language, the Husay language unified the cultures of the North versus but when the when uh, again when the british came and colonized this ended the sakota caliphate but still uh, islam and sharia law are still central in the northern part of of um, nigeria in the south the south is going to have a different experience again this is why they uh, nigeria struggles with nationalism the south um the the yoruba and the igbo um, they were actually colonized by the Europeans. Um, and so the Europeans basically took control of, this, of the South in contrast to the North. Um, and as a result, we're gonna start to see that um, Europeans are gonna move in and build up infrastructure, railroads, right? They're gonna institute the European slave trade. So there was a lot of intervention by the Europeans, particularly the Brits in the Southern part. And as a result, the, the South will grow um, uh, and be benefited economically. Also, Christianity is also brought to the South due to the British colonization. But then um, Nigeria gets its independence in 1960 from the British. And so they're going to struggle with democracy, much like we saw the Mexicans struggle with democracy. 
So um, in their first republic, they're going to model the British system, the Westminster system. Uh, but again, democracies are fragile and it just devolves into dictatorship. Uh, ending with the Biafran Civil War, and this is the southern part of Nigeria wanting to uh, separate from the rest of Nigeria. And uh, again, they use the Westminster model. The Second Republic was kind of like the first, except they tried the American model as opposed to the Westminster model. They were hoping that using the American model would limit the amount of conflict between the various um, ethnic groups. But the same thing happened. Dictatorships democracy dictatorships right the third republic is 1993 to 1998 and in this one um what characterizes this one is a lot of repression and corruption so again more dictatorships the fourth republic this is where they're gonna finally attempt to democratize um starting with abasanjo and the pdp and then um going through a series of relatively um uh relatively stable um presidencies uh that uh go all the way to today's president in nigeria bahari okay but because of their struggle part of their political values are prebendalism and the patron client system prebendalism is when um officials and elected leaders use their position to gain personally um, and another major political, another major political uh, belief is Islam, right? All right, so political socialization includes Islam, um, and the the failure of political socialization is because not all are Islamic, right? So it lacks a shared political culture, and it creates a society that it has difficulty nation building, and as a result, it has, of course, that national question. Last but not least is Iran. So they're also authoritarian, but not totalitarian. Um, they're also, though, unlike Nigeria, but like Mexico, very nationalistic. So um, the union of political and religious authority is a part of their political culture, right? Um, so they're all not only Muslim, um, but which means that they are, they subscribe to Islam but they're Shia Muslims as opposed to Sunni Muslims. They are mostly Shia Muslims, which basically means that um, they believe in that uh, the successor to Muhammad is blood related. Uh, and we talked in class about um, the hidden 12th Imam and all that kind of stuff. All right, so they uh, are nationalistically, ethnically Persian, right? And they speak the language of Farsi. So the arrival of Islam is um, invasions by Arabs who introduced Islam into the region of these Persians. And even when they were part of the Persian Empire, right, Islam started to become the, a major religion within it. Even when the Mongols defeated the Persians on the 13th century, the Mongols converted to Islam. So it has, Islam has been a unifying factor uh, throughout uh, is, uh, Iranian history. Okay, so um, after the Persian Empire, we see uh, a series of empires like the Safavid. Um, this is tab this made Shia Islam, um, the established religion, right? Cre and, and it led to Iranian identity. The Qajar dynasty, these were Turkish people who conquered the Safavids. And um, when they did that at the end of the 18th century, uh, they brought a level of tolerance, right? Because they're Turkish in this Persian um, group. So a little bit of tolerance here. Uh, largely, Iran has escaped European colonization. Iran never officially was colonized by Europe during the imperialist era, unlike Mexico and Nigeria. So, but they, they were under authoritarian rule, um, largely because of Europe, even though we weren't actually colonized by Europe. The Pavlavis, the Pavlavi dynasty is um, an authoritarian dynasty and it is uh, the Shah, the Shah is the king, so it's a monarchy that was put in place largely by um, the British and the Americans. Uh, now, because of sh this Shah rule, there was an attempt um, to overthrow the Shah and institute a democracy 
um, Mohammed Mosaddegh, uh, represented middle class people who emphasized Iranian nationalism and that we should have Iran for Iranians, not Iran for the West, uh, because you know oil was discovered in Iran. So he attempts to institute a democratic uh, regime, but because of a coup by the British and the U.S. CIA, the Shah goes back, and so the Shah establishes um, a rentier state, again, renting all of the land for oil usage by the West. Um, White Revolution, which does um, was an attempt by the Shah to uh, gain the hearts and minds of the Iranian people by industrializing and improving farming and all of this, but it's going to lead to the 1979 Islamic Revolution in which a theocracy is established using what is known as jurist guardianship. These are all political values, by the way. The idea that the chief interpreter of Islam and the, is the highest ranking cleric and is responsible for all aspects of Iranian society. Um, and, uh, and the reason why uh, the Shah was overthrown in the 1979 Islamic Revolution is largely because the Shah had become a totalitarian, too secular. Remember, they're very religious. Um, the Shah was too secular, meaning non-religious, and too Western, right? Um, renting everything to the West. All right, lastly, political socialization. This is through education, through the cultural uh, revolution known as uh, the White Revolution. Um, Islam, right? Uh, family structures, uh, TV and radio are state run. So that's another form of political socialization known as the Islamic Republic of Iran's um, broadcasting, right? So the IRIB. And there's, of course, heavy control over the media, including censorship. All right, guys, I will see you later. Bye.